All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have no school Monday. Today we're doing a lecture. Uh, we have no primary this week because we have no school, and, like, you need me to lecture. There's just so much content. Uh, Tuesday you have 11 through 20 and a map due, which you should have finished the map yesterday. You may have a little bit of coloring, but that's about it. On Wednesday, you have a test, 30 minutes. No one should be stressed about the 30 minutes. Most of you are finished with like 10 minutes to go at 35, so you still have a little, a pretty good comfort space. So you should feel pretty good about that. Your focus and pieces are due. Any questions about what is happening this week? Now, you have a three-day weekend. When you come back on Tuesday, it is going to move very quickly. You saw how you struggled on the test. Can we agree? With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, you do need to take the work seriously at home and you need to take the work seriously in class. You are in second semester. It's all names, people, books. I warned you, you're seeing it, yes? Okay, there's more content this semester than there was second semester, almost by a third. It's going to be harder and faster. Now the good thing is we already have a strong pattern. Can we agree? We understand what it looks like. We understand what we need to do. So take it seriously. I would really take the time. I'm not expecting you to do shit for me on Sunday because you know your girl ain't thinking about you people on Sunday. Okay? Uh, Monday, you should be working on your work. Okay? Get it done and you'll be in a much better spot. So when you come to class, when I'm covering content, you already have the background knowledge and you can kind of frame it up and it'll be easier for you to retain. Everyone good? All right, here we go on your whiteboard. What two natural resources need to come from the earth in order to industrialize? I have a couple wrong answers. What are they, Shannon? Coal and iron ore. Who can raise their hand and tell me why iron is wrong? Maggie. It's the finished product. It's the finished product. So ladies and gentlemen, coal and iron ore is perfect evidence for your essays. They have an essay on industrialization. You'd be a moron not to mention only countries with large supplies of coal and iron ore will score. However, if you write iron, no points. No points because you clearly don't understand what natural resources are because they're finished product. It's a big deal. Three letter, little letters will get you a point or not a point on the AP exam. Okay? So it's a big deal. Make sure you know the difference. Okay. What major piece of infrastructure is required for a country to industrialize? Because they need to move raw and finished products. Ashlyn. Railroads. Railroads. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the first country to industrialize? We talked about it yesterday on your map. We're going to cover it today. Good. What is it, Cade? Great Britain. What is the second most powerful country to industrialize? They had plenty of natural resources and plenty of railroads. Good. What is it, Madison? France. Third country is the United States, which we didn't really talk about. Who is my fourth country? They have tons and tons of railroads, even though they don't have a ton of resources, but they can import resources very effectively. What is it? Emily. And so, on your whiteboard, give me my top four industrialized countries in order, please. Top four industrialized countries. We just covered it. Good. Good. Who are they, Emma? Uh, Great Britain, France, US, and Germany. Great Britain, France, America. Germany, those are your top four countries. You need to know that. It is only going to become more and more important as we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of, this is a little bit of a throwback, but you're going to see his name here shortly. Uh, who's the guy who, you, uh, who unifies Germany? It was on your test this week, by the way. Good, I got one, two, three, Sam. Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck is going to lead the industrial charge in Germany, which will make Germany number four, three, three. no, four, four. America. Uh, number four in the world. So is he a big deal? Is he a big power player? For sure. So you're going to see him again. All right. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is uh, the Nick, Nick, uh, what is the new social class that arrives because of the industrial revolution? What is the name of Social, a new social class. I will take either its name or its nickname. Either or. Good. 
What do we got, Jared? Proletariat. Proletariat. Proletariat or the industrial middle class. Don't say middle class at this point. As we get away from factory jobs, like for instance, none of your parents probably work in a factory. Can we agree? Very few people here in the United States. Do your parents work in a factory? Oh, well, you were shaking your head like, yeah. Okay, I was like, oh, that would be so cool. I know one person, one person in my life works in a factory. His name's Travis. He works a press machine. Sounds like Travis would work in a press machine, doesn't it? Um, anyway, he works out in Plant City, and he does some sort of pressing. I don't know what he does. I have no idea what he makes, but he makes something. Uh, out of all the people I know, only one person works in a factory. So are we in, do we have an industrial middle class here in 2020? Nope. Do we have a middle class? Yes. So be careful using middle class when we're talking about the industrial age. Does that make sense? When we get to the 1950s, 1960s, when we start getting away from industrial jobs, that's when a middle class begins. So make sure you're careful of your language because the AP exam may, may stick you on that because they're jerks. Tell me how else they're not. All right, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when people are moving into the cities looking for jobs? What is it called when people move into the cities looking for jobs? What do we got, Claire? Urbanization. Urbanization. All right, here we go. So, yesterday we talked about the beginning of industrialization. We talked about the end of cottage industries. Who can tell me why cottage industries are ending? Why, Reagan? No, you're, I have no idea where you're going with now. Madison. Yeah, factory jobs. So we have factories that are making these products. It's cottage, in, what is the cottage industry, people? What's the cottage industry, Shannon? Yeah, but who's doing it? Yeah, people at home. Well, now we have factories doing it for eight to 15 hours a day. Will you be able to comp compete with those prices? No, so they're getting outpriced, okay? It's just like when Amazon opened up their doors and started really doing the two-day shipping? Has it killed big box stores? Yeah, absolutely. It's changed, uh, it's changed the American economy for sure. All right, so you're going to have a new heading, the beginning of the industrial era. Put in the drop, it says drop off box, and it's late, so I just don't. Well, I'm still late. So, beginning of the industrial era is your new heading. We need to know it starts in Britain in the 1780s. I don't need you to memorize it, but I just want you to have a frame of reference. So does it start before the American Revolution? No, because the American Revolution starts in what? Yes, 1776, which is just before this. So the American Revolution is not an industrialized war. It is not an industrialized war. It is not an industrialized war. Immediately after is the world industrializing. Yes, that is what you need to understand. Every other revolution has been touched by industrialization. Yes. Napoleonic Wars. Yes. Okay? So, you need to know it starts in England because of their natural resources and infrastructure. You saw the map we did yesterday, which is the real reason why we do it. Okay? It's that you can see how advanced the British are because of their natural resources. Okay. We're going to put a big star, ladies and gentlemen. This is big, big, big. This is super important. Right before the Industrial Revolution, you're writing this down, right before the Industrial Revolution, we had the second agricultural revolution. Right before the Industrial Revolution, we had the second agricultural revolution. Which is also going to start in England, by the way. I don't care if you know that. Okay. So, there's a couple things you need to know about the second agricultural revolution. Okay, first of all, it's going to have a food surplus. Okay, what happens when you have a food surplus? Population increases. Population increases. You need to write that down. I'm not going to write it down because it's like, it kind of hurts to stretch that high. I'm not going to lie. Okay, so 
you need to know, first thing it's going to cause is a food surplus, which is going to cause a population increase. So, are there plenty of people to be working factory jobs here shortly? Yes, yes that's the connection we'll be making here in a second. Okay, so you need to know, they also have new technology, new tech, okay? This is going to be crop rotation. Slash three field system. Okay, so what that is, you're going to draw this little box. Okay, planted, planted, fallow. F means fallow, which means empty. Spelled empty wrong, that's funny. Okay, so. Next year, fallow, planted, planted. Okay, so what's happening here? When we talk about three field system, what does that mean? What does it mean, Shannon? Yeah, so the earth can recover. Okay, it keeps food big. Instead of if you keep planting on the same thing, your crops get smaller and smaller every year, and then you overuse the soil, that's a huge thing. We also have the seed drill. Seed drill, which will allow planting in rows. Planting in rows, which creates more food. More food because less wasted space. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we plant in rows. Like if you drive by a cornfield, isn't it kind of crazy? Think of how perfectly they're all lined up. It's because they're perfectly spaced, so they are using the most of the land. Beforehand, we used to just stick our hand into the seeds and start chucking the seeds as we walked, facing it, so we'd make sure we had the ground covered. But if we have two seeds that are next to each other, are both of them going to grow? No, one of them is going to die because they're not going to get their roots in, and one is going to live, correct? If we have a bunch of them too close together, are they all going to live or maybe one or two? Maybe one or two, and that's the problem with it. So we have a ton of seed waste. Well, someone figured out that, hey, if we plant them six inches apart, or depending on the crop, four inches apart, 12 inches apart, whatever it is, we won't waste a single seed. That's pretty smart. So we're getting more out of our seeds. We're getting more out of that. Okay. So new technology you need to know. We have more... Disposable income. Why do we have more disposable income? Why? Because with all this food, we have surplus, right? Surplus equals cash. So if I only need, you know, 50 bales of hay for my family, but I ended up, because of these new technologies, have 150, I can sell 100 bales of hay. Is that good for me? Yes, absolutely. So all of a sudden, I have more income. Well, when we start making products like dresses and candlesticks in factories, what can I do? I can buy it for the first time because of this technology. So is the second agricultural revolution a big deal? Yes, absolutely. Without it, the industrial revolution would never have occurred. Okay? So I guess we know population increases, and I, I know you wrote it down next to surplus. But the population, I'm going to write it again down here because it has another impact. Population increases, people can work in factories. People can work in factories. And that's fine. There we go. Okay, so we have enough people. All right. There you go. Oh, that's why. People can work in factories and enough people to purchase goods. So we're going to make, start making all these goods in the Industrial Revolution, but if no one buys them, does that help us or hurt us? Hurt us. So we have to make sure we have plenty of people to buy. And that's the other big thing. All right, perfect. All right. So... Ladies and gentlemen, what came first, the agricultural, the uh, ag second agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution? 
Second agricultural revolution comes first, then the industrial revolution. Okay? All right. Perfect. How exciting. Except my little thing is not working because my computer is cranky. Shit. All right. Here we go. All right. So, we already know the British have the advantage, which is why it starts. So you don't need to write down. We know they have coal and iron ore. We already know they have transportation. They have the railroads. They also have a river and canal system. Okay. Um, we, I was in London this past summer, and we got to go up to uh, uh, Canary, uh, Canary Street. Anyway, it's up north side, and it's all canal system. And you can, like, ride kayaks through the old canals, and that's how they used to move things before railroads. They built this massive interconnecting uh, canal system, which is how they moved goods before they started building railroads. And you can still sail on them today. Like, people live in riverboats in London. That's crazy. That's so cool. Anyway. Um, and then imperial colonies. All right, so major technology. All right, so we're back to the Industrial Revolution. That's pretty much everything you need to know for the agricultural revolution. Everyone good? So, major inventions for the industrial revolution. It's your new heading. Major inventions for the industrial revolution. First thing you need to know is the flying shuttle. Okay? It is. You can write John K. I don't personally care if you know who does it. You need to know it is going to allow faster weaving. The flying shuttle allows for faster weaving, which will make more textiles. Ladies and gentlemen, in your notes, you're going to put a big star right here, right now. Textiles are the most commonly made item in the uh, Industrial Revolution. Textiles are the most commonly made item in the Industrial Revolution, and England is the leader of textile production. Who can raise their hand and tell me what a textile is? Oh my god, literally you're covered in them, people. You are literally covered in them. Reagan? It's fabric, ladies and gentlemen. Textiles is a fancy word for fabric. Okay, so the most popular item in the Industrial Revolution to be made is fabric. We just don't call it fabric, we call it textiles. Okay, so textiles. So the flying shuttle is going to make it, okay, faster, much more effective. The next major invention is the mule, which makes thread. Oh my God, why do we need machines to be making thread faster? Because thread makes... Textiles. And what is the most popular item being made during the Industrial Revolution? Textiles. Oh my goodness, how exciting. Okay, and then finally, we have the power loom. Why do we need a power loom? To make textiles. So, we have the flying shuttle, which just shoots thread back and forth. Then we have a machine that makes thread really fast. Then we have a machine that puts it all together called the power loom. Okay, this machine is what actually makes textiles. These are all trying to speed up the production of making textiles, but a lot of humans are used in this. Some humans are used in this. No humans are used in this, except for children. When it breaks, they got to stick their hands in there, and then they lose their hands, and then they stain. You know, obviously, into the textile, and then they have to pay for the textile out of their wages, and then they have no hands. Just a club. Yeah. Yeah. There's no such thing as workman's comp. Like if you lost your hand at work, you had to pay for what you ruined. <laughs> oh, <really>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. This is a very big. Big invention. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first three major inventions are all about making textiles, which is the most important thing. Ladies and gentlemen, James Watt is a name you absolutely, absolutely, absolutely need to know. James Watt invented this steam engine. He invented the steam engine. Okay? This will power 
most machines until we start using fuel for a long time, until we have um, the combustible engine. You need to note that, okay? Until we have the combustible engine about 40 years later. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are using a steam engine, what do you have to have? How do you get sleep, my love? Oh. 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 You need water. Yeah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes, you do need coal, and I will accept coal, but like, you need water. <laughs> Just making sure. Okay. You need water. So every factory has to be along the river. It can't be along an ocean. Why can't it be along an ocean? That salt water and salt water corrodes iron, correct? So the only material we're using right now is iron, and iron's very, uh, uh, it corrodes. Okay, so it corrodes. So you need to write down any factory that uses a steam engine has to be located near rivers. Do we want slow moving rivers or fast moving rivers? Fast. fast moving rivers. You need to note that because the water has to flow into the factory, then it has to be heated by the coal, and then they push all of the steam. Because what happens is, is that they push the water into the, uh, the heating system. The heat is then going to uh, evaporate it, and it's going to push out and turn the turbines inside the machine. And then eventually the hot air will cool down, and what then happens? Condensation, and then eventually it will return back to water. And then it needs to exit the plant, yes? Okay, so it's a nice little cyclical thing. So they have to be located on the water because there's so much water coming in and out of these factories. They have to be located on a river. Ladies and gentlemen, are there tons and tons of fast-moving rivers in the world? No. So does this limit where and who can industrialize? Yes, this is a very big deal. This limits who and where can industrialize. You should probably write that down. Okay? All right. Your next major invention is the Bessemer converter. Your next major invention is known as the Bessemer converter. It is created by Henry Bessemer. I don't really care if you know his name. You need to know it superheats iron to make steel. It superheats iron to make steel. Who can raise your hand and tell me what's the difference between iron and steel? I need a hand. Who can tell me the difference between iron and steel? Jared, what's the difference? <clears throat> Not always. There's only certain amounts of stainless steel. We have no idea. You've been living in a world surrounded by iron and steel your entire life. You're literally encased by it right now. When you drive a car, you're literally surrounded by steel. You have no idea. What do you got, Daniel? The steel's stronger. Like a hundred times stronger than iron. Which is why you don't drive iron cars. A, it's super heavy, so it'd be like, uh. uh. And second of all, it really can dent pretty easily. So, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that steel is 100 times stronger than iron, but super expensive to make until this invention. Beforehand, there's only one real, uh, there's only two real applications for steel prior to the Bessemer converter. You used to wear it as jewelry. Now, ladies, if you're wearing jewelry, is it because it's expensive or cheap? Expensive. expensive. Okay, it takes really, really hot, 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 hot flames to burn off all the impurities to take iron from uh, from iron to steel. So it was used as jewelry, and it was used for weapons for our samurai. Okay, that's what makes samurai swords so valuable, is because they were made out of steel, which is way stronger than any of the iron swords a lot of the Westerners were carrying. So. When we have the Bessemer converter, all of a sudden, steel is now cheaper. Now, does anyone know who is going to make it mass-produced? Huh? No, it's not for it. No, it's American. He's an American guy. 
Ladies and gentlemen, what is the name of the terrible football team in Pittsburgh? Steelers. Why are they called Steelers? Yes, Pittsburgh was the largest producer of steel in the history of the world. So, Pittsburgh is going to be the capital of steel. It is going to be. It is not by Henry Bessemer. His name is... It's not Carnegie. Carnegie Standard Oil. Shit. I'll come up with it. I'll come up with it. Give me a second. Anyway, uh, that's why they're called the Steelers. It's not an animal, people. We didn't know. So if you go to uh, Pittsburgh, anyone been to Pittsburgh? If you've been to Pittsburgh, it has railroad tracks all over the place. Why? Importing and exporting of the steel. Because it literally built the United States. There you go. Well, yeah, I guess they're... There you go. See? Are you from? Or just been? No. I've never been to Pittsburgh. All right. Railroads are your next major invention. Who is the guy who does slow lines in the manufacturing Okay. Uh, your next major invention are railroads, ladies and gentlemen. You need to know that the rocket is the name of the first railroad, and it went 28 miles an hour. Oh <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, keep that in mind. Your top speed of your average horse, top speed, which means it can only run it for like a couple of minutes, is like 15 and 16 miles an hour. Like the average horse, not like your racing horse, which can go much faster, which are bred for speed. Like your average horse can only go 15 miles an hour. So all of a sudden, you can sit on something and go 28 miles an hour. I mean, people are getting nauseous and puking <laughs> because they've never been that fast before, which makes perfect logical sense. Okay? So you need to know that the rocket, which was invented in 1829, I would just write 1829 just so you have a frame of reference. I'm not asking you to memorize it. I'm just giving you a frame of reference. Is the first steam-powered uh, locomotive. Okay. Then we're going to start seeing steamships. Okay. Steamships are going to be invented. Steamships are going to increase the rate of travel. Okay. And because of railroads, we are going to see massive transportation increase and massive industrialization growth. You need to know that because of railroads, we have massive transportation growth, which means what? What does transportation growth mean? People are now doing what? Shannon? Yeah, they're moving around much faster, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you. But would you have gone into a covered wagon and went west? No. I, your girl's not brave, is what I'm saying. Like, I, me and my husband are not going to climb into a wagon and be like, yeah, we're just going to go that way and we're going to survive. Because we're not going to survive, okay? We're not. My husband, cute, very smart, not helpful. Me, not brave, and like, I can't deal with nature, you know? Not for us. However, if I can take a train and go west, your girl's gonna think about it. I can sit in like the first class, I can get served food while I sit there and watch the buffalo out the window. People shoot the buffalo from the windows of the train, which is why we have no buffalo anymore. Yeah, that's why we don't, because people on trains just to shoot them as they drove by. That's why we don't have buffalo. <laughs> Because they could. <laughs> yeah, they're super slow and they're big mass animals. We used to have so many of them that you could just look out the window and you could see thousands of them. So people used to just shoot them from the train. That's why we don't have buffalo anymore. We're fine. And then the car carcasses would just lie there. And then they would rot. They didn't even eat them, they didn't use them. We just shot them from the trains because the trains are going. That's why we don't have buffalo. That is why we don't have the American buffalo anymore. Because we're idiots. <laughs> There's no more American buffalo. I think we have like five. Five? I don't know. There's like no more. There's no more wild buffalo anywhere in the American Because we shot them from trains. All right. We need to do some boards. We've covered a lot of information. On your leg. Uh, on your leg. 
on your whiteboard. Please tell me. Who are my five most uh, four most powerful industrialized countries in order? You need to know this. Cold, flat, dead. Who are my four industrialized countries in order? Good. Sterling. There you go. On your whiteboard. Please tell me. Uh, what occurred before the Industrial Revolution that allowed the Industrial Revolution to occur? You need to have three words down. You can't just write the last two. You've got to have... <laughs> You gotta have the first part. Evelyn. Second agricultural revolution. You need to note second agricultural revolution because if you just write agricultural revolution, it's like the first time people have farmed. We're a little bit beyond that. I don't know if you've noticed, yeah? Okay, so you have to acknowledge it's the second agricultural revolution because if you just write agricultural revolution, it won't score because they're gonna be like, no, people have been farming since like, you know, the dawn of time. So you gotta make sure your language is correct. It does matter. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is, give me two inventions from the second agricultural revolution that is going to increase crop production. Good. What do we got? Uh, what do we got, Jared? Uh, the seed drill and the crop rotation. There you go. We got seed drill and crop rotation. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What invention will spark the Industrial Revolution and require all factories to be near rivers? Good. What is it, Evan? Steam. On your whiteboard, please tell me who is the inventor of the steam engine. You do need to know his name. Good. Who is it, Sam? James Watt. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the invention that allows us to mass produce steel? Good. What is it, Sophia? There you go, the Bessemer converter. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the first railroad? Good. What is it, Lily? There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... I'm trying to figure out who the first American steel tycoon is, and it's driving me insane. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the most uh, important... In, uh, what was the most popular uh, in, created item during the Industrial Revolution? That was a terrible question. It is Carnegie! Damn it. It is Carnegie. I was right. But then I didn't have faith in myself. It's Andrew Carnegie. All right. Who is it? Kate. Kate. Sorry. I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Katie. All right. It is Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie is the guy who, he is an Irish, uh, I know all about his story. I just couldn't come up with his name. He is an Irish uh, immigrant from Ireland, obviously. And he sees the best American converter. And then he comes to Pittsburgh uh, with like a thousand dollars in his pocket tells people I can do this I can do this and people invest like ten thousand dollars in him and then he creates and industrializes the first major uh, Bessemer converter in order to heat steel and that is going to turn into what we now call um, massive steel production which is where Pittsburgh is why Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh um, Andrew Carnegie you've heard of Carnegie Music Hall in New York City one of the most important buildings. It was built by him. He's the first millionaire of America to be self-made. So he's like pretty legit. Anyway, I know you don't care. All right, here we go. Okay, so we have roads. Okay, factory system is your next heading. Okay, your next major heading is the factory system. Okay, the factory system is when people leave their home to go to work. Ladies and gentlemen, why is this a novel idea? Who can raise your hand? Why is this a novel idea? Lauren, why is this a novel idea? Like going to work. Okay, but why was it a 
to change before. Yeah, people are farmers. Where do you farm, people? Or you, if you don't own the land, you work on, you live on the land, right? So you like leave your house and you're four minutes away from being there. Okay, so all of a sudden, people are now going to work. This whole idea, this modern idea of going to work starts now. Okay, so what is going to happen is factories need, are created because the machines are too big. Factory system is created because the machines are too big for home use. So they have to build massive structures in order to home the buildings. Okay? By putting factories in cities, they have a, lar a large population of unskilled laborers. You need to know that. So there's three major reasons, three major changes that come to the factory system. People are going to work for the first time. Factories, the actual shell of buildings are being built to build to be built around these massive machines. And the third thing is that by building them in cities, they have unskilled laborers. Who can raise your hand and tell me what's an unskilled laborer? Come on, people, this is a big idea. William, what's an unskilled laborer? No. What do you got, Lily? Uh, I think it's not really educated. There you go. Somebody's not very educated. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, if you work at the Ford plant today, 2020, okay, you have one job at the Ford plant. Oh, like my friend Travis. I don't know what he makes, but he makes something. He says he works on a press. So in my head, this is what Travis does all day. <laughs> I'm not really sure what he does, but he makes something. Okay, so what he does all day is that he takes the metal, because it's a press, so it's like typically metal. I really should find out, shouldn't I, what this kid does. No, he doesn't make t-shirts, because that'd be cool, and he does not do cool things. Huh? License plates. No, he's not in prison. <laughs> you didn't know that prisoners make license plates? It's like the cheapest thing, because they're government made. Yeah, it's like a thing. Moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, Travis takes metal sheet, okay? and puts it in a press, puts it down, and then pulls a machine and presses it, okay? Then, when it's done, the machine kind of pops open, and then he takes the metal press and puts it in a pile on the other side. When he's done with that, what does he do? Yes. Grabs the other one, puts it under the press, closes it, wait till it pops open, then puts it over there. That's what he does. Because some things can be automated, it's depending on the companies, if they can afford to automate at this point. It's also very expensive. That's what he does all day. Does it take any intelligence to do that? No, it doesn't take any. That's what unskilled labor is. If I can teach you to do one thing, like screw like a bolt onto a car, you're in charge of one bolt, and this is the bolt. Yeah. And then the next one comes by and you go, ah! and the next one comes by and you're like, ah! as unskilled labor, you don't need any education, you don't need any actual skills, there's no crafting, there's no thinking, you just do the same, like my boy Travis, eight hours a day, oh I forgot the lift, sorry, that's what he does all day, no, but I, I've seen him dance and you don't want to see that, so hopefully he doesn't do that. Uh, but yeah, that's what unskilled labor is. It takes absolutely zero intelligence, but it does take, you know, the strength and the patience. And that's what unskilled laborer is. Most of your industrial revolution are unskilled laborers. You need to know that. About 90% of all work is unskilled laborers. Now, if you're unskilled, like for instance, every person in this room is capable of doing Travis's job. Can we agree? You grab paper from here, a little paper sheet, you press it, pop it open, then you move it over here. Do you think he gets paid well or not well? Not well. Why? Maggie. Because literally anyone can do it. So does it got give us the laborer power or no power? No power. That's a big deal. Unskilled laborers, and you need to note this, have very low wages. Because they can be easily replaced. Anyone can here can do Travis's job. Okay, so working conditions is the next big thing, okay? Working conditions. 
They used to, during the early part of the Industrial Revolution, which is, of course, where we are, used to be six-hour working days. What days did you have off? Sunday, because it's the God. It's the God. <laughs> it's the Sabbath. It's, uh, you know, it's the day of rest and all that crap. So you used to work six days a week, and you used to work 14 hours a day. You need to note that. It is not until significantly later do we have uh, regulations on this. So keep that in mind. When something new is happening, do we have a lot of regulations? No, it's only as time progresses that we start regulating and making better, correct? So we're at the very early part. You need to know of a people called the Ludettes. You need to know this. This is a big deal. This is a test question, by the way. The Ludettes are people who protest machines. They're anti-machine. So these people would go and break into factories and smash the machines because they thought machines were replacing people. How's that looking in 2020? Yeah, they were right, but like, they're also like hurting, you know, themselves too. So it's kind of a funny thing. So they're gonna protest machines, okay? Um, eventually, the movement will die out, but they are gonna execute them. So you just need to know that the Ludettes are a group of people who hate machines, and they say they're taking jobs away from humans and all that stuff. All right, that's where we're gonna leave off, and you will see that we got our boy Bismarck back. I mean, are you at least interested in the nationalization? Yeah. I mean, it's better than like the good stuff, right? Well, I had a really book about this. No girl works in the factory. Oh my god, I remember. That was so good. I think it was a lot. Alright, have a good day, guys. Have a good three day weekend. Get your work done. I don't know. Okay, I don't remember.